the amount of revenue that it generates and the amount of impact that it generates is huge per subscriber. Uh, if you had, if you were just like a productivity guy and you had 18,000 subscribers on a newsletter, I don't think you could generate $350,000 a year in revenue. I mean, it'd be pretty amazing to do that. I mean, maybe you could, but there, there wouldn't be quite as many benefits. And you know, you don't have to get a lot of subscribers to have an awesome local newsletter. Before we dive into this episode, I wanted to take a quick 15 seconds to tell you about the Send and Grow newsletter. If you love the content you get on this podcast, you'll absolutely love the Send and Grow newsletter. Get newsletter deep dives, actionable tips, and resources every week. Sign up now at sparkloop.app slash newsletter. Link is in the show notes. Now back to the episode. Today, I'm thrilled to have Ryan Snedden with us on the podcast. Ryan is the founder of Naptown Scoop, a local newsletter for the town of Annapolis, Maryland. But Ryan's journey didn't start in journalism or newsletters for that matter at all. As an engineer turned entrepreneur, he's leveraged his skills to build a five day a week newsletter that not only informs, but fosters a strong sense of community. Today, we'll dive into why and how Ryan started Naptown Scoop, the challenges and triumphs of growing a local newsletter, and the exciting opportunities it has unlocked for Ryan and the Annapolis community. Ryan, it's fantastic to have you with us. I've been following your journey for a few years now, and you were, if I remember correctly, one of the original local newsletter guys tweeting about all this local newsletter stuff. And so let's kick things off by learning more about the beginning of Naptown Scoop and why you decided to start a local newsletter. Yeah, it's funny to hear you say years ago. Uh, that make, it, It's true. I started three and a half years ago, pretty much. And I am an engineer by training. I went to school for that. Uh, but why did I start it? Because I just, I, I knew I wanted, couldn't work for anybody. Uh, known that for a very long time and didn't really want to be an engineer anyway. Just kind of wanted the, the training to think like one. Nice. So I only worked a job for a year after I graduated college and I didn't even do engineering. I was a software consultant. And then I started, or I quit uh, to start something. I didn't really know what it was. It took me seven months to figure out that it was Naptown Scoop. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, Naptown Scoop is a digital local newsletter. Um, I guess we're on the Sending Grow podcast. Everyone's going to know. I don't have to say the word digital, but I'm so used to explaining it to uh, people in my town who have no idea what that is. Uh, but yeah, just a, a local focused email newsletter. Basically like if your newspaper was sent into your inbox every morning, except it's pretty positive. Uh, you know, we're not, we, we talk about crime every now and again. Like we just had to talk about one last week. Uh, but it was one of those things that like, you can't really ignore everybody in town's talking about it. It's, it, it's hard to determine what we do and don't cover on mm -hmm. that crime area, but you know, when you have to just by, you know, if, if it's one of those things, that's kind of shocking, then we'll probably put it in there just so people are aware of it, uh, especially if there's any major updates to it. Um, and then we also don't really do much politics. We'll do like uh, campaign announcements and who won and stuff like that, but we're going to stay away from that pretty heavily. We don't do any political advertising. Um, someone just asked for some of that last week. So <laughs> yeah, that's a long way of explaining it. But uh, if I had to go two sentences, it's like if your email was sent or if your newspaper was sent into your email inbox, but it was super positive and mostly told you about all the fun stuff happening. Nice. And what town is that for? Uh, for Annapolis, Maryland. Nice. It's the capital of Maryland. It's a pretty small city, about 41,000 people, um, about... 110,000 in the surrounding area. Okay. okay. So let's take us back to kind of the beginning. You mentioned, you know, about three and a half years ago or so when you started it up, what prompted you to, you know, go, Hey, I want to start this local newsletter because. Uh, I just, because I saw someone else doing uh, it. I saw the guys from 6am city. I went to college in Columbia, South Carolina. And so I saw them doing their cold today product. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but to be honest, I thought I could do it better. So if Ryan and Ryan are listening or anybody from there, yeah, that is a little bit arrogant of me. <laughs> yeah, I saw it and I was like, I can do that. Uh, I didn't really think about it too much. It wasn't like an immediate connection where I saw it and I did it. I saw it and then I followed it mostly just as a user of their product, not following it to look into their business model. But then when I learned that they had other cities, they weren't just doing Columbia, South Carolina, I was like, whoa. That's interesting. Uh, they must be doing well if they have seven cities. And so I kind of looked into it and I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Hmm. And then that was, um, I don't even know when that was, a long time before I even quit my job. I probably 
almost a year before I quit. No, probably like almost about a year before I quit, uh, which is right when I basically right I started. I learned about them. Okay. And then uh, I quit, moved, and then I, when I moved somewhere and we didn't have a newsletter like what I did in Columbia, I was like, huh, I just want to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered that it thought it was a good business model. And so I started doing it. Just like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not um, not the kind of guy who will sit around and think about an idea for very long. I'm, a, I'm definitely a doer. I'm doing something with a partner right now, a uh, new thing, where we've actually kind of been talking about it for a year. Mm -hmm. And we just had an hour and 10 minute Zoom call yesterday to go over pro formas he'd made and stuff. And I was kind of sitting there being like, all right, Matt, like, we just got to do yeah. this. <laughs> Let's get started. Yeah. You know, you've, we could we could live in this spreadsheet for literally years if you want to, or we could just get started. Yeah, a bias to action is um, quite often a good thing in in a lot of scenarios. So that's it's probably for the better. Um, so when I first saw you, I mentioned earlier um, that I you know first saw you a couple probably a year and a half ago, roughly talking about NapTown Scoop and growing a local newsletter. I had been writing a newsletter myself, and I thought that was a an interesting angle and one that you know, I hadn't really thought about, I live in a town similar size to Annapolis, around 40,000 people. And there's definitely, I mean, if there is, they're not doing a good job of promoting it, but there's no, there's no local newsletter here. Um, and so it makes me think like, Hey, that would be, you know, an interesting business opportunity. Um, and I think a lot of other people are thinking that as well, because I now see more and more people. Um, you were the first that I saw, but and I know you were the, you know, the first local newsletter, but you're kind of my first window into it. And I've seen more and more people starting up local newsletters um, and talking about it online. And so I'm wondering, why do you think it's become, you know, this really sort of popular, uh, for lack of a better term, type of newsletter that people have really looked into as a business model to start? I think in the entrepreneurship circles or people who want to be entrepreneurs, there are always certain businesses that everybody kind of sees as a great starting point. You know, a couple of years ago, it was drop shipping was a really popular thing or starting an Amazon store. Um, if you're more into the physical world, then, you know, starting a landscaping business was a really popular thing. And so I think newsletters have kind of become one of those. They're very easy to start. You could spin one up in less than an hour um, for free now with all these tools that are out there. And so I think... It's just one of those things people look at. And also we had a lot of, not a lot, but a couple of newsletters have really good outcomes. Like anybody who has their own newsletter has almost certainly heard of the hustle or morning brew and they see that and they're like, well, you know, those things sold for tens of millions of dollars and maybe I could do the same thing. So they became really, really trendy. And I think the you know how exactly did the local newsletter catch on uh if you want to dig super deep in maybe people did see 6am city maybe people saw axios local mm. maybe people saw me maybe people saw andrew wilkinson because every once in a while he would tweet about what he was doing up in victoria canada right. and i'd always notice the tweet would get a couple hundred thousand impressions um so you know i think uh, over the last four years people have just been talking about it enough to get this small group of entrepreneurs on the internet to think about it and i noticed mostly when people were talking about it before three months ago that nobody was really doing it like some people always do yeah. it right but i feel like now i've seen a lot of people actually starting them and i used to want to own hundred of these things and start them all myself, uh, basically create a giant local media company. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I realized over Christmas of this year, which would have been 2023 Christmas, I always take two weeks off at the end of the year and really look back on the year and think about what's coming up ahead. And I decided that that was not what I wanted to do anymore. And I was going to start teaching people how to do it instead. And then through that, I also... I discovered a couple of people that I wanted to partner with. So I'm now kind of back to that desire of having multiple of these, but instead of me just being in charge of, you know, CEO or whatever of this organization, 
I'll have partners in some cities around the country or the U S uh, that I'll do this with, but I'll have fewer of them instead of shooting for a hundred. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking more like 10 to 20 of these things. Uh, but then I want to help a thousand people start their own just because it's so easy and every town can have one pretty much. And it is a great thing to have, whether it's a fun side hustle or a full-time job, like it is for me, it's a pretty awesome thing to have once it gets going. So, you know, one thing you said there just reminded me of like kind of the Alex Hermosi story, right. Of trying to launch a whole bunch of gyms and then, um, thinking like having that, um, kind of inflection point or that moment of clarity was like, well, I think somebody even advised him, why don't you just teach people how to do this? And so that's kind of, you know, what you're doing now. And, um, and I think that's probably, you know, there's some people that want to dive into the weeds and, and launch, you know, like you said, 50 or a hundred different, um, local newsletters, but you know, for, for some people, I think going the teaching route, it might be a little less stressful and, and, uh, um, maybe a smoother path to go down. So I don't blame you for doing that at all. I'm wondering though, like what makes, a, what makes what elements do you think make a really good local newsletter that people not only want to you know subscribe to because oh it's my city and or it's my town whatever it is um, I should probably subscribe to it but actually like open it up on a regular basis and read it. I think the most important thing is to not be out of touch with the city. People can tell or covering the city that doesn't know anything about mm-hmm. it. Uh, they're not going to think about the right things. They're not going to put the right things in the newsletter. They're not going to know the inside jokes of the city, what the city makes fun of, you know, what are the most important events in the city. Uh, So it's really important to be, I don't know if involved is the right word, but you really do need to know the city. And that was another part of my decision to not try and start a (laughs) hundred of these things was that I was going to have to find a hundred of these people or 99 of them, because I guess I'm the one here in Annapolis. But uh, I was going to have to go find basically 99 rock stars. And I had no platform to do that. I had no plan to do that, really. I just said I wanted to. And so that's kind of where the teaching thing came in, which at the time was funny, because I was going to go all in on the teaching and not do anymore. And then through the teaching, I started to find Mm -hmm. some of those rock stars. And I was like, huh, What if I swung the pendulum back a little bit and still actually started some of these with partners who were those rock stars? Um, It's kind of funny how that worked. But yeah, I think the most important thing is to know the city really well. Um, I knew Annapolis pretty well. I grew up about 45 minutes from here. So we were hanging out here a decent amount. Um, But I really just kind of learned by immersion. I would come over here all the time and literally just hang out here with no agenda. Mm. Um, I now live here, but when the, for the first year and three months, I did not live here. And I would literally just come and be here. And so that meant that if somebody said, and this is a real story, you know, hey, I need a crew for sailing race in 45 minutes. Are you available? And that was just a random Instagram DM I got. If I had been over at my parents' house where I was when I started this 45 minutes away, I wouldn't have been able to do that. But I was literally just hanging out here on a random day. And because of that, I was able to to go. And that's when I learned what the Frostbite Race Series was. And if you didn't know what that was, then how are you supposed to tell other people about it in town? Um, So I just think it's so important to be local and also to really feel local. There are other local newsletters out there that do not feel Mm. like they have the flavor of the city at all. Uh, and I think it's really important to make sure you have that. I like that. That makes a lot of sense too, because yeah, you can, you can write about, you can just, you know, source kind of curate your information from maybe other sources as well. But if you're not actually living in it, you don't, you don't have that inside, uh, not insider knowledge, but just like vibe of the town, like you said, which is, which is really important. And I think people will sniff that out pretty fast. So what do you think are the main benefits of starting a local newsletter? And then on the flip side, what are the biggest challenges? So, um, you know, I imagine it helps you stay involved with the community as well. Um, there's some you know, monetization benefits that we'll get into, but um, what do you see as some of the main benefits? And then um, once you've done that, you can let us know what you think some of the biggest challenges are. Yeah. So, you know, probably break down into, I would say three main benefits, at least the ones that I look at. There are 
probably um, almost certainly more, but they're, these are the three that I am most excited about. Uh, the first one is just the monetization. You know, it's, it's a business. You can make it a pretty, not a huge business. Uh, it depends on the size of your city. In 40,000 people, it's not going to be huge. I'm, I'm targeting, you know, I think for, it, it would be amazing to get Naptown Scoop to do a million dollars in revenue with a 40,000 person city. Annually? Uh, yeah, uh, but that would be like, Really, really amazing until, of course, you know, years and years down the road when inflation takes <laughs> over and prices are going up every year. But like when I look at the current year um, or, or like even the next three years, if it could get to a million dollars in revenue, that would be a huge win. So I think in other cities, when I have these partners, I think we'll hopefully be able to do significantly more because we're going to slightly bigger mm-hmm. cities. But here, that's that's that is a, a great benefit, though. It's my this is my full time job. Um, it's. You know, I took three and a half years to get there and it wasn't the most comfortable three and a half years, but now I'm like, cool. Like, you know, I have a good salary that I pay myself and, you know, it will continue to grow hopefully significantly. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one benefit is just, it is a business. And when it's your business, you can basically decide how much money you want to make. You know, do you want to make more? Okay. Then pick up the phone and make more sales or hire a sales rep and make more sales. Uh, The second thing is kind of like social capital if you want to call it that, uh, it's, that's probably like the, the politically correct way of saying it. The, the arrogant, not politically correct way of saying it would be you become a local celebrity. Uh, it's kind of weird. I did not anticipate that at all. I always, from day one, I put my face on the newsletter, but that was only because I thought that people connected with people, not brands, which is something I say all the time. Um, and so I, I wanted people to know that it was me behind it, but I had no idea how people would get attached to that um, to the point where it's, it's kind of wild what happens. I mean, you, I have been, I I have met people at a a bar restaurant and when they realized who I was, I got invited to their engagement party a couple of weeks later and like it, in a month and a half, I'm going to Florida for their wedding. Now I've actually become friends with yeah. them now, but in the beginning it was, Oh, you're, you're Ryan from the Neptown scoop. Like, do you want to come to our engagement party? Wow. Or, you know, like sometimes uh, remember people's names and they're like shocked that I, that, that me, that, that you remember my name, like you're famous. And I'm like, what? Um, so that's kind of weird. That also does play into you know, like some of the challenges of it. Cause, um, Everybody always talks about, or at least everybody that I know in my favorite entrepreneur circles is they always talk about you want to be rich, not rich and famous, uh, because being famous comes with its own sorts of problems. And, you know, I'm obviously not famous. I'm just well known in one town. Uh, I can leave and nobody knows who I am. And that's great. But there are challenges that come with that in the town where you actually are well known. Um, so I don't want to talk too much about that because I feel like it makes me sound like a huge jerk. Um, but then the third benefit, and this is probably my favorite one is you own an audience in your town Mm -hmm. and you can launch anything you want out of that audience. So on one hand, right now I am running a campaign to buy a house for this family that lost their father and oldest son in a horrific shooting last summer. Um, and we're raising, I think we're raising $250,000. I can't even remember. Um, I need to remember, (laughs) I should know that better, but you know, we've already raised, I think we just crossed over a hundred. Um, so that's something that we're able to, that I've been able to do through it, but then also on a more personal benefit side, uh, this business I was telling you about that, This guy and I spent a bunch of time in the spreadsheets yesterday and we're going to launch that basically completely out of my free marketing that I have. Uh, And then there's several other businesses that I want to do out of that. So that's kind of my favorite benefit is anything I want to do that is in town is just so much easier. If I wanted to open a restaurant, which I never Mm -hmm. would um, because restaurants are mostly terrible businesses, then I would have my free built-in marketing. I would be able to probably, if the new space came available on Main Street, I could call all of the commercial real estate brokers and they all know who I am. And I know them, I I would call their personal cell phones. Mm -hmm. 
it just makes everything easier. Um, there's one restaurant. I, I say I would never want to own a restaurant. There is one restaurant that I'd want to right. buy, uh, and it's in Annapolis. It's a great restaurant. It does a lot of business. It, it's it's a brilliant business, but it's like, you know, not many restaurants are like mm -hmm. this. And I've been working on the owner of it for probably about a year now, uh, just so that he knows when he wants to sell it, that hopefully I am his first call. And it's convenient because he wants to sell it to the right person, he calls yeah. it. And that would be somebody who loves the town, somebody who's involved with the town, somebody who's involved with philanthropy. And if I didn't have this local newsletter proving all of that, then he probably wouldn't even consider it. But, um, you know, I think at some point, hopefully he's a pretty old guy. Uh, hopefully in the next five years, he'll want to sell it. And I hope that I'll be considered for being able to buy yeah, it. Yeah, that's really cool. You know, I think the, the big kind of general takeaway that I feel with this is just the main benefit is the opportunity that this is like unlocked for you in a number of different ways. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the, there was, I think it was Barstool Sports a while ago. Somebody there said, you know, if you have an audience, a passionate audience, you can sell them whatever you want. And I totally agree with that. And I think that extends to more than just local newsletters, but in terms of, you know, benefit per subscriber there, I don't think there is a higher leverage mm -hmm. newsletter than a local newsletter um, because I only have, and I say only there's people that have just started that would be like, wow, you're not grateful for your subscribers. <laughs> but I only have eight, I think it's uh, 17,800 subscribers. Okay. And it's almost half the town, though. It is almost half the town, <laughs> but the amount of revenue that it generates and the amount of impact that it generates is huge per subscriber. Uh, if you had, if you were just like a productivity guy and you had, 18,000 subscribers on a newsletter, I don't think you could generate $350,000 a year in revenue. I mean, it'd be pretty amazing to do that. And maybe, maybe you could, but there, there wouldn't be quite as many benefits. And, you know, you don't have to get a lot of subscribers to have an awesome local newsletter. That's one of the things I like about it. And another thing I liked about it, and this was, has turned out to be true, is I always thought in the beginning, you know, I'll run Facebook ads until we get to a certain size. And then at some point I'll just stop and I will make sure that we continue to uh, fill in the churn because people do unsubscribe. But at some point I'll be able to just turn off my advertising spend. And I did that about, I think almost two years ago. I, I spent all my money on Facebook at the beginning and I haven't spent any in a long time. And the, the newsletter still grows every single week. So that's another huge advantage is you know exactly how many people can read it because you know the population of that town. Uh, it's it's like such an easy way to niche down. Um, you know, like I said, if you're a productivity guy, where do you get your subscribers? Who do you target? How many people out there can possibly read it? What's your what's your total addressable market? Mm -hmm. Those are really great questions. Yeah. With a local newsletter, you know. How many people can read it? Well, how many people are in town? How many people in the surrounding areas? Okay, cool. That's the, that's my TAM. How do I get to them? Facebook ads with the locational tracking. Super easy. Um, it's just a very easy niche to target. Yeah, there's way less guesswork involved. It's pretty it's pretty cut and dry and de definitive to to a large extent, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not that smart, so I like that. <laughs> I'm sure you're smarter than you give yourself credit for. This episode of the Send and Grow podcast is brought to you by Sparkloop. Back in February, we launched our biggest affiliate competition ever. We're giving away a free two-person trip to Cancun. The good news? There's still time to win. Just head to your affiliate dashboard in your Sparkloop account and share your link with other top newsletter operators. When they earn, you earn. It's the easiest way to generate thousands in extra revenue for your business. Become our top earning affiliate through the end of April and you'll win a free trip to paradise. Get started before it's too late. And now back to the episode. Uh, what are the biggest challenges then? I know you mentioned one um, about kind of the, the the blessing curse of being sort of a, a local celebrity, if you will, um, you know, in, in quotation marks. But what else aside from that would you would you say is a big challenge with a local newsletter or running a local newsletter? Yeah, so I think growth is one of those things. Um, if you're not willing to spend money on Facebook ads, I don't really know how you get this uh, local newsletter to be mm -hmm. big, fast. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is the best way 
And so people ask me all the time, how do I, how do I get big without Facebook ads? I'm like, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> Um, all the other ways are pretty slow, you know, referral programs, you need to have a pretty good amount of subscribers for that to make a meaningful yeah. impact. Even when you do it, like I have a pretty meaningful amount of subscribers. It's still only accounted for 20% of my list. It takes a while to get on the SEO train. Um, it like you can't use uh, referral or uh, like other growth networks like the spark loop upscribe i think it's called or the beehive boosts because those the people that you're going to get from that they're not in your yeah. town so that's a new thing that you don't have access to um you can't really grow on twitter that much because like i could post on twitter and anybody in the world yeah. sees it but it's it's so it's just a growth is tough if you're not willing to spend money on facebook ads like that's my advice is just bite the bullet and mm -hmm. do it and then start selling advertising and you you will make your money back hopefully um pretty good chance that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, it really kind of is a grind. Uh, you know, it's a great bonus to be able to be in the town and be around and, and have, a, you know, that, that local celebrity presence. But also, if you have a, I, I don't know why I keep thinking on productivity today, but if you have a productivity newsletter today, like you're just writing that at your desk every day or every week or whatever, and you're sending it and then you're going about your life. When you have a local newsletter, you have to be, you're like the newspaper reporter. You got to go to the things. You have to go to the press conference lunch today that happened. You have to go to the green beer races this weekend. <laughs> and, you know, all, that is fun. It does. It, I still love it. But there are also times where, like, I've had something to go to Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday that are all, like, pretty tough events like you kind of have to be on your game you're not just going and being there for a little while you're going and you're talking to a bunch of people you're representing your business you might maybe even have to give a speech at some of these things or or host some of these things and so you do have to be willing to do that i, I think this is not really an introvert's game um so that might be a challenge and then i try to think what are the other greatest challenges i i, mean, I guess kind of the same thing that I just come back to the same word to grind the content because you're doing news and curation. You can't really do a lot of this stuff ahead of time. You are really kind of reacting to what happens. Right. And so if you're going to do this every day, like I do now, uh, and I luckily have a team now, but it is a grind and you, you, you need something exciting to happen all the time. <laughs> You need and you need to be watching and looking out for those things, and so that is another challenge. Is it's definitely a a grind to keep the content machine mm -hmm. running, um, and it never it never starts to run itself. Mm -hmm. You always have to be there looking for stuff. Yeah, and whether that's you or somebody you're hiring to do it, it has to happen one way or another. So yeah, and like I send every weekday, so that means somebody's writing Sunday night and usually that ends up being me. <laughs> and so I'm fortunate that the rest of the time throughout the week, the team mostly takes care of writing 90% of the newsletter. But, you know, Sunday nights, I was explaining this to someone recently, like my weekend, I don't work a lot on Friday because I work a lot on mm. Sunday. Um, so my weekends are kind of Friday, Saturday instead of Saturday, Sunday, like most people. But also sometimes I have to go to things on Friday, Saturday that are work right. things. Right. And, and, uh, so when you go to those events, are you there, um, like, you know, with your, with your phone recording people, interviewing them and taking pictures and stuff, or is that just more of a showing up kind of getting a feel for the event so you can write about it later and maybe getting a few sound bites from people or what, what does that look like? No. So, uh, I don't do a lot of interviewing, uh, at okay. all. I, it's, I'm not a journalist. I wasn't a trained journalist. I'm, don't care to be like, I don't ever say that Naptown scoop is run by journalists or anything like that, but it is taking a lot of pictures and it is going and making notes to, you know, what, what is the feel of this event? Mm -hmm. um, telling people we, we are going to tell people about it later, maybe. So I want to take some pictures and get, get some of the key information, things that happened. Um, but a lot of times it's really just being there and talking to people. Um, it is some of the greatest marketing I do is to go to these events and I always wear something that says Neptune scoop right. on it. And so 
people want to talk and maybe the new business owner comes up and says, Hey, I just opened. Can you talk about my restaurant? Or somebody's like, Hey, uh, I've got a client who's opening a new business and can we talk about it? Or somebody just has an interesting story that belongs in the newsletter. And so you need to talk to them about it. Yeah. Then um, it's really just showing your face. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Do, do you think a, uh, a town needs to be a certain size for a local newsletter to succeed? Yeah, I probably wouldn't do it. I personally wouldn't do it in anything less than Annapolis, anything less than 40,000. But there are a lot of towns out there that could handle it on a, a less frequent basis, like we send every weekday. Right. If you were in a town of 20,000 people, you could definitely send a once a week mm-hmm. newsletter or probably even a two or three times a week newsletter. Um, I'm just not interested in that because, like I said, it's my full-time job. And if I go do this with a partner, I'm, I'm not interested in something that can generate you know, $200,000 a year in revenue. I'm interested in something that can generate a million or yeah. more, um, especially when you have a partner, the split there, at, you know, it's just not worth the effort for making $40,000 a year or something yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, if you're going to do it as a, a side hustle or a hobby, then yeah, you could definitely do it in a smaller town. But I personally won't do anything in less than 40,000. I only did it here because I just happened to be here. I moved back with all my siblings and I moved back home during COVID in 2020. And this is just where I was. So I always figured I'll test it here and then I'll go start more elsewhere in bigger right, places. Right. Cool. Okay. So uh, 40,000 roughly is kind of an ideal size, at least for somebody who's looking to do it full time. I'm wondering, you mentioned, you've mentioned a little bit about writers. And so, you know, even when I think about running a local newsletter, say in my town, you know, I can't imagine like sourcing and curating all the right information at the right time. You mentioned, you mentioned it's a lot of reacting to, to news and information. Um, and you guys do it five days a week. So what does like a daily process look like for, you know, writing Naptown scoop every day? And I know whether that's you writing it or the team writing it, what, what kind of is a, uh, average day in the life of the uh, of for Naptown Scoop employees? Yeah, so I'll go back in time like a year okay. ago, two years ago. A day in the life was I wake up, I look at all the things that have happened. I have a list of places we check and it, also people do send stuff into the email. So I would go look at that in the morning and then see what we're going to cover out of those things and then start writing. And then in the afternoon or the evening, check all those places again, see if there's anything to add and get to writing. And then at some point decide that, you know, that's enough for the next day's newsletter. I'm going to cut this off and then start editing it. Cause I always say there's no such thing as good writers, just good editors. Um, so that's always a, a big chunk of time as well. And then I would schedule it and do it all over again. Now it, it looks a lot different. I have an assistant that'll check all those places for me and I still decide what we cover. She basically gives me anything that has anything to do with Annapolis. She puts it into what I call a hopper and then I'll go in and look at it and say, yes, we're going to cover that. No, we're not going to cover that. Yes, we're going to cover that. No, we're not going to cover that. And then I assign each of the stories we are going to cover to one of my two writers and they're the, the cutoff for new stories every day is 3 p.m. So they know that there's never going to be anything new after 3 p.m. If there is something new and it's giant and has to be in there the next day, I'll handle it myself. Okay. Um, and then they try to, I, I like them to have all the stories done by like four, hopefully, hopefully four, maybe five. Um, and then I'll go in and edit them and then mark them ready for the next day. And then the assistant will go in and put them into our newsletter sending software, ESP. And then I go give it a once over, read it out loud, make sure it all sounds mm-hmm. good. Is uh, no typos or anything. And we still make mistakes yeah. with that. Definitely made a mistake the other day. Um, I think it was, no, this was not food poisoning day. Uh, I did make a mistake on food poisoning day and someone called it out. And I was like, honestly, that's not a big mistake. I don't yeah. care. <laughs> um, I didn't tell them no. that, but that's how I, that's how yeah. I felt inside. But we made a big mistake. Uh, two days ago i try to avoid these that's why like when my writer writes something it gets marked for primary editing and my assistant goes in and she's supposed to check all the facts like if someone says it's thursday february 9th then she would go in and check that thursday is actually february 9th and that the event actually is that day so double check the website or something like that 
Um, and then hopefully I'll catch it too. But every once in a while, mistakes slip through still. Like, uh, And this happened mostly because I wrote it. This was the Sunday to Monday newsletter. So it didn't actually get that primary mm-hmm. check. Um, so I, on the Navy football schedule, I switched two games uh, where they were playing. So we had to put out a correction the next day. And uh, over a dozen people told us about the error, which is a really high number. Uh, no, most people don't take the time to correct you. They just read it and think you're an yeah. idiot. So if, if 12 people took the time to actually email, then how many more? Everybody noticed this was like a really bad mm. thing, to bad mistake. Luckily, it's months and months in the future, so we didn't send anybody to the wrong place this tomorrow that's or good. yesterday. Um, so it was an easy correction to make, but that's that's kind of the process okay. now. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so you basically write the newsletter the day before for the following day, um, get your writers who are writing a majority of it for you once you guys have decided what's going into it. And um, you kind of do a final review that after, late afternoon, evening, and and uh, your assistant queues it up for, for sending the next morning. Yeah, and that's why I say it's a grind because it is mostly reactive. There are very few stories we write in advance, uh, probably less than one a week that get written ahead of time. You know, they're all written the day or two before. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot to uh, cover every day over and over. It's a... Uh, it truly is the hamster wheel sort of business uh, of, of getting on local events, local news as it's happening. So what have you done for monetization? You did mention uh, a figure earlier about $350,000, which um, I, I don't want to assume that that's your annual revenue, but you've obviously monetized the newsletter. You plan to monetize it up to a million dollars. So what are you doing for monetizing a local newsletter? What are what are the possibilities for for monetizing a local newsletter, what can what can be done? Yeah, so right now we're all pretty much all advertising supported. Anything that we do outside of ads is minuscule. I mean, probably less than two percent of the revenue. It's it's almost all advertising. And so, yeah, the three hundred and fifty is the target for this mm. year. Last year it was two hundred. Um, the year I, it's a major difference because I'm hiring sales reps, and I I do think we can actually do it if we sold out every single piece of advertising mm-hmm. we had that would be half a million or roughly you know there's volume discounts that might not shake out exactly yeah, yeah. there but that's if i sold out everything that i've created at the time right now that's that would be that half a million number and i say everything i've created because the digital project right i could just create more if i want um that's based on five ads every day in the newsletter and then a couple section sponsorships but if I wanted to and was willing to dilute the quality a little bit, I could throw in banner ads, yeah. maybe throw in another 250000 onto that 500 mm-hmm. So that's something to consider. I haven't done that yet. Uh, but then there are other opportunities for monetization, like uh, you know, one that I don't really want to talk too much about <laughs> until I actually do it. But it's, it's a big event, and um, it would get the whole community involved. It would be uh, – I, I think it, if – I can get to a million uh, and I'm not going to get to a million in revenue without this mm-hmm. event going the way that I need it to. So it'll be a, a fairly significant thing. Um, but I, I hate to do this because I really don't care about like no, most of the time I'll, I'll tell everybody anything I'm doing and tell everybody numbers. Uh, but this, this one thing is something that there's like a little bit of competition. Oh, in town okay, for. Okay. And so Keep it under your hat. I kind of just want to, yeah, yeah I, I want it to be kind of a surprise when it happens. I don't want people to know that I'm going to go do it. Um, I just want it to be, you know, uh, a good surprise when we do it. But events will be kind of the next thing that help us get there uh, to that million number. And then that, and that'll be like a big ongoing several month event. But then there are little events like hopefully we're going to get it done. Uh, three months on June 6th, I want to do a candlelight concert. Oh, cool. If you've ever seen those, uh, I think that would be pretty cool. And that's not going to generate a huge amount of money. But if you can make three or $4,000 in one night, then that's not nope. nothing. And then, uh, you know, I want to do a pickleball tournament as it gets warmer. That's something I've wanted to do for like two years, but I just didn't have a good place to do it. Actually, a good friend and a business partner and something else just started his own pickleball facility and so he wants to do one and i was like nice. perfect now i can finally do my pickleball tournament um so events will be something and then we do like a little bit of physical product sales like 
every year, got one right here. We make a candle for um, some f nonprofit to pick some cause and, you know, sell that candle and make, it's got some local scene on it and we donate most of the money, but we've proven that we can sell several hundred of those every mm -hmm. year. Um, and, you know, people are going to buy a cool thing, whether it's for a cause or not, if it's a cool yeah. thing. So we could definitely sell physical products that that's just kind of a lot yeah. of work. Um, I don't really like doing that too much, but there are other, th those are kind of my big ways to monetize. But the, uh, the really, the thing I'm most excited about, like I told you, go back to the, the three benefits. It's not the advertising or the selling candles or events or anything like that. It's the fact that I could start a business out of this, you know, like, let's say I could do a, a fence building company mm. and the fence building company could get to do $3 million a year in revenue at a 20% margin. You know, that's an awesome thing to do. And then you can go sell that, but you don't have to sell the, the newsletter mm -hmm. that you built it out of. Um, and so I think that the, uh, the leverage to start other things, like I said, that's what I'm truly most excited about. I think that's probably where I'll make most of my mm. money over the next five to 10 years. Interesting. That's really interesting. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have guessed that that's where, where it was going, but I mean, when you explain it that way, it makes a lot of sense. So that's really savvy. I, yeah. Cause like <laughs> you, I don't think it's even possible to get, I mean, maybe it's possible to get Naptown scoop to be a three to $5 million right. company, but it's very possible to get some kind of local service business to three to $5 sure. million. Dollars. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a very good point. I think you're going to get um, a lot of a lot of wheels turning in a lot of listeners' heads right now about um, you know how to how to start and leverage a, a local newsletter for for things more than just a newsletter. So, like I said, the fence building thing is actually something I am considering. I don't know anything about <laughs> building fences, but I'll figure yeah. that out. Uh, that that's something that I would be pretty involved in. There are also other opportunities that have come out of this where people have been, in, you know, would would you invest in me and I'll be the operator, you know, me speaking as mm -hmm. them. And I would just kind of be the marketing partner. And that's, that requires almost no yeah. work. So that's something that's also interesting, but I'm a little bit more interested in being involved at this point yeah. in my life. Uh, so I think there's, there's bigger upside there, but if, if even if it is more work, um, but there's, that's, like I said, the, the opportunity to leverage the newsletter is what I'm most excited mm -hmm. about. It's not so much the advertising that I can sell. Um, it's it's the network that's come out of it. There are a couple people in Maryland that are very, very powerful, wealthy people, you know, actual billionaires that live in or around Annapolis. And some I've actually met, some of, you know, they, I don't know if they would remember me, but uh, I always just say like, let's say I had the right pitch and I needed to raise money for something. I can make one phone mm -hmm. call not to directly to those billionaires, but <laughs> to the, the person that I know that mm -hmm. knows them and for the right pitch, they will make that connection. And then I now can make that pitch to them. Um, so that all, and then that wouldn't be possible without the yeah. network. So yeah. the newsletter, leveraging the newsletter is what I'm most excited about rather than actually advertising money from Fair it. Enough. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, what would be your, we'll, we'll wrap up with one last question here. Uh, what would be a number one tip for success with a local newsletter that, that you could offer listeners? Uh, nothing, nothing too <laughs> exciting, honestly. Uh, just set a schedule that you're going to do it and commit to doing it. And if you commit to doing it over, you know, even one year, but let's drag it out far and make it a, a crazy number, commit to doing it for three years and you don't miss a day on your schedule, uh, it'll absolutely change your mm -hmm. life. Like I'm not, I'm, I will guarantee that if you, if you stick to it for three years, yeah. I guarantee it'll change your life. And that's probably, I know people are probably wanting some like great tactical, super secret tip, but that's it. Uh, I think the, the people that win in business are not the ones, they're not the smartest. They're not the hardest working. They're not the most well-connected or the richest at the beginning. They're just the ones that are left over at the mm. end. Uh, Cause very few people have the discipline to stick something out for that yeah. long. And then like three years, that's not even that long of a time, really. Um, feels like one at this point in my life, pretty young and only been doing this for three and a half years. But, you know, in 20 years, if I still own Naptown Scoop, I, 
I can't imagine uh, what will have come mm-hmm. out of it by then. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I get to go to a lot of business anniversaries in town or, you know, see them happen. And I see what people have built when they have a 10 year anniversary and a 20 year anniversary and um, pretty soon a 65th anniversary that I'm wow. seeing. And, you know, I won't be around when that town scoop is 65 <laughs> years old, uh, but I'll be around when it's 40 years old, mm-hmm. hopefully. And I can't imagine the, you know, in 40 years, what will have come out of this thing. Uh, most people just don't think long-term yeah. like yeah. that. And if you are willing to think long-term and be disciplined, then pretty great things can happen. I love it. Long-term discipline, great mindsets to have. Uh, Ryan, it's been awesome chatting all things local newsletters with you. I want to, to if you if you care to, um, share where people can follow your journey and uh, potentially, I mean, subscribe to Naptown Scoop at least to see you know what a what a quality local newsletter looks like, or if they happen to be listening in the Annapolis area, uh, they can subscribe. But yeah, fill us in where we can find you online and uh, check out Naptown Scoop. Yeah, so if you do want to check out Naptown Scoop, you can just go to naptownscoop.beehive.com. And you can check out all the past episodes without having to sign up for it. Um, and then for more stuff like this, you can follow me on Twitter or X uh, at life of underscore scoop, or uh, I think it's life of scoop Again, I'm not uh, not big on the, I haven't done a lot of custom domains yet with the teaching thing. That's a, that's still a new thing. If you go to life of co, you just go to the, uh, the that's, I've just linked that to our Shopify where I've, started selling a couple things to help people get started with local newsletters. But cool. yeah, Twitter is probably the best way. And then, or the, the life of scoop newsletter. If you or if you found this podcast at all interesting, then you'll find that stuff interesting. Cause that's all I talk about. If somebody wanted to connect with you to say, uh, consult with you on local newsletters, that's where they would go. Life of scoop. Uh, yeah. Just DM me on Twitter. I see all the DMS. Um, I haven't gotten any of those high converting landing page DMs yet. Have you? I can, no, I haven't. I've seen them going around, but uh, I guess I'm not important enough. <laughs> I know. I feel uh, I feel out of the loop that I haven't gotten any. So hopefully, hopefully yeah, soon. I see all my hopefully DMs. Soon. I keep it very clean, and uh, the DMs are always open. I think people sometimes people say they have trouble DMing me, but I'm pretty sure I have all the settings on, so you can anybody can DM awesome. me. Awesome, Ryan. It's been awesome. Thank you uh, for coming on, and uh, best of luck to you and Naptown Scoop in 2024. And we'll be watching. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks for having me. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Send and Grow podcast. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe to show your support. And we'd love to hear your feedback, so drop a comment below letting us know your number one takeaway or share with us who you think we should interview next. All of the links for the show are available in the description below. Thank you so much for your support, and we'll see you next time.